On today's Join Us in France, the second part of our trip report with David, where he shares some great hacks on how to visit major museums with a child, talks about taking the Eurostar and visiting a little-known museum called Musée des Arfourins on a day trip to Paris from London. To open the show today, I want to talk about the autoplay on Join Us in France on the website. When you go to the main joinusinfrance.com page from a computer, the last episode of the show starts playing. Now, why do I have it set up to autoplay when you go to joinusinfrance.com? It's pretty simple. I realized a few months back that most people who visit the main page of the site do not understand that it's a podcast. The only way to tell them is to play an episode. Google sends lots of traffic to the website, but they decide what search terms land you on Join Us in France. And some of those search terms are kind of funky. So you've got visitors who look at this for a few seconds and have zero idea what it is. So for them, the autoplayer is a plus because it makes it crystal clear very quickly. But if you already know that it's a podcast and you want to look at the show notes for the latest episode, the autoplay is annoying. I'll admit it. I don't like to be surprised by my own voice booming on today's Join Us in France either. I've actually heard myself saying, shut up, lady, <laughs> a few times. So here's the trick on how to stop that. The autoplay is only on the main page. Once you click on any other post or page on the website, you have navigated away from the autoplay and it will stop. So let me give you an example. For a few days from today, the first thing at the top of the page is going to be Two Dads in Paris, episode 112. If you click on that title, the player will stop. Or if you click on anything else from that page, or on any of the episodes listed on the left-hand side bar, or do a search and select one of your results, the player will stop. So anytime you're away from the main page, the player stops. It's that simple. So remember, click away from the main page, and you're done listening to me when you don't want to. It's that simple. Welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you for having me again. It's, it's lovely to have you. So where we left off last time, you, you had told us about your first two days in Paris, and it was really exciting and wonderful, and we decided there wasn't enough time to, to do it all. So let's, let's review a little bit who you are and sure. um, you know, what you, why you came to Paris and where you're from and all that good stuff. Okay, great. Uh, my name is David Palachuk, and um, I travel with my family, uh, my husband, Michael Tursini, and our son, Zane Tursini Palachuk. And um, we started coming to France uh, the first time for my husband's 50th birthday. And uh, our son at the time was seven, mm -hmm. and we enjoyed it and had taken some more uh, subsequent uh, trips to uh, Europe, but wanted to get back to Paris because the first time that we'd gone to Paris, we were only there for three days, and that's just really not enough time to see the city. Um, I always wanted oh, to go to Oh, please say that again because people just – people drive me crazy. They come, to, they, they, they come to Europe, and they want to do Paris, London, and Rome in, three, in a week. You can't. You can't. You shouldn't, and, and right? No, you shouldn't because one of the things that I think is the best part of being in a city is walking around and just being in the city. And, yes, you, you want to go to the Louvre or you want to go to the, the Musée d'Orsay or something like that. But the most important thing is sitting at a cafe or, you know, walking along the river or walking through the Tuileries Gardens or something like that. And right. you, you just you can't do it. In, in a day or two. You right. just can't. I, I think if, if all you want is a few selfies in front of monuments – then you should be okay. shot. <laughs> well, yes, yes, but but you you can manage to take a few selfies in front of monuments in a week in Europe, but that's all you're gonna do. So don't kid yourself. You haven't seen Europe if that's what you did. 
No, you, you absolutely not. <laughs> so it, it's funny. So we decided to, to go back. So I've been, um, I've been, you know, making the case to go back to Paris since the, the first trip that we had made. Um, I had also studied, uh, French for five years when I was in, uh, high school and, and college and had pretty much forgotten everything by the first time that we had gone to Paris. So this, before we went the second time, I actually started studying French again. Oh, wow. So I had been, I had been studying French for about six to nine months trying to get my French back. And actually, I think what was better, my second trip than I actually had ever been speaking French, even when I was actively studying it, I used two apps. Uh, one was Rosetta Stone and the other one is Duolingo. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they're both... Um, geared towards, you know, personal, uh, language learning. So by the time we went back the second time, my French was, was pretty, was pretty workable, was, was pretty good. Excellent. So the, the reason why we ended up going to Paris the second time is it was the middle of last winter and the winter in New York last year was crazy bad. Very it was cold. Uh, yes. very cold, really, really snowy. And we just, we decided we, we needed to get out of the state. So we started looking at flights to go to the Caribbean and they were really, really shockingly for me, shockingly expensive. And I happened to make the offhanded comment, oh my God, you could go to Europe for, for less. And we said, well, okay, well, let's, <laughs> let's look and see. So we looked at Paris and we're like, oh my God, it's like thousands of dollars less to go to Paris than it would be go to go to the Caribbean. So we were like, okay, it's February. It's not necessarily you know, prime weather in, in France, but let's go. And, you know, the first time that we had gone, because, you know, Zane was young, we had made a pact that we weren't going to do museums because we didn't think it was fair to fly a seven-year-old across, you know, an ocean and then make him spend days going through museums. Yeah. But this time, because we were traveling, he was a little bit older and, you know, we were traveling in February. We didn't know what the weather was going to be like. And it actually ended up being really beautiful while we were there. It was a little cold, but it was, it was, um, you know, sunny almost the entire time that we were there. And so we said, okay, the weather may not be that great. So let's actually try, you know, going to some, some museums. So I'll, I'll get into that in a minute, but just to, to kind of back up, one of the things we also did, um, while on this trip is we had had some neighbors that had lived in France for about five years. And we actually asked them, we said, okay, well, where would you stay, oh. um, if you were staying in Paris? And they had recommended to us their favorite hotel, which is the Pavillon de la Reine, mm -hmm. which is in the Marais. Mm -hmm. And it is actually on the Place de Vosges. And oh, it's wow. re really fantastic because, Every morning when you wake up, you basically leave the hotel and you're there just at the Place de Vosges. And uh, for anybody who's been at the Place de Vosges, you know that it's surrounded by a colonnade all the way around. And this hotel actually is in that off of that colonnade. Wow. So, um, you know, you walk through the colonnade, you walk through the the huge historic, um, you know, wooden doors and you go underneath one building. And then all of a sudden there's this beautiful um, courtyard that you walk through and then the hotel sits in the courtyard and it's ivy covered and you walk in and you know the ground floor one side of it is a, a beautiful library with a um fireplace and then there's another room um and it's it's just it's really fantastic you actually almost feel like you've got you know an apartment in in paris wow that sounds good it, it was really fantastic <laughs> um so um, the, the first day when we, when we got back to Paris, um, we, we made what I consider to be a mistake, but because we're both designers, we both had said, you know, we've never been to the Paris flea market and this is mm -hmm. something we should do. So we had this idea that, you know, we'll, we'll fly in, we'll be jet lagged, but you know, to try and get over jet lag this time, we'll get a car service to take us out to where the Paris flea markets are. Right. Saint-Ouen. Saint-Ouen yeah. and, uh, Les Pousse. And we thought, you know, and this is probably because he's going to be jet lagged. This was probably the least amount of resistance that we're going to get from our son, you know, mm -hmm. trying to drag him out there. Um, but we got out there and I had, we had been warned, uh, on our first trip to Paris that, um, saint was not the nicest part of Paris. Correct. Uh, and, um, but you know, we definitely got to see that with our, with our own eyes this time because, uh, we went out and, you know, the closer and closer we got, we're like, oh, Oh, I didn't know that, you know, Paris <laughs> could look like this. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, we got out there and, you know, if it had just been the two of us, I think it, it would have been okay. Um, but, you know, you the, the reality, we felt uncomfortable and, you know, the idea of 
being in that that neighborhood with with our son who you know was ten at the time, dragging him through shop to shop. And the other thing, you know, didn't seem fair. And the other thing that started going through our minds once we got out there was, okay, well, how do we get back to the hotel? You know, right. I, you know, I I don't know the metro well enough to know how to get back. And once we got out there, you know, was, this is like pre Uber days. I was like, I don't know how to get a car to get back to the hotel. Right, right. So, you know, we, I started, and this is why it's really good that I had started relearning French because I, I told the driver, I was like, you know, he didn't speak a word of English. Wow. And so I, I told him, it's like, you know, Mr. We, we don't want to be here. And he looked at me and was like, yeah, you did. This is exactly where I, you, know, you told me to go. And I was like, no, please take us back to that. And he started arguing with me. He's like, no, but I mm. took you where you wanted to go. And yeah. I, I finally had to tell him in French, it's like, no, I understand you did take us where we wanted to be, but you know, now that I don't want to be here, I don't want to be here. So we went straight, we went straight back to the hotel. So basically, I haven't been to Saint Ouen to the Puce, but generally speaking, I've been to markets such as this in other towns in France and they can flea markets are, they're a little rough around the edges and you know this. Yeah. Even if you show up right after, it's a mess. People don't take care of stuff. They don't pick up. It's like, so um, you're dealing well, with a population too. that is not very careful. And it's, it's funny when you, when you get out to it, what I really, cause you know, our, our idea of Les Pousses was going to be, you know, the, the flea market in midnight in Paris. And that's not, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> not, not at all what you see. And, and what, you know, what I think, really made up our minds is when you get to it, there are all these parking lots that are just filled with RVs and there are people selling stuff out of RVs. And I mean, it's, it's really, it's, yeah, it's rough. It's rough. So anyway, so we, we went do, back. We have antiques kind of markets that are much nicer. Uh, so it's a, a marché des antiquaires or something like this where it's higher ticket items and but of course if you go to the flea market you might find the unbelievably low price item that you've wanted that's why people go right. but uh not yeah. for kids <laughs> yeah no no Agreed. not at all so so what we did was we took that we took a car service back to the hotel and then we just we just started wandering around and you know that was one of the best things about being in the marais is just really wandering the streets in the neighborhood i mean we're now just completely in love with it and uh one of the other things that you know there's this really beautiful um patisserie that was right on the corner of the place de vosges and we had flown in on valentine's day and so there's this really beautiful pastry shop, and all of the pastries were Valentine's pastries. They were all pink, and they had rose petals on them. It was just mm. fantastic to see. Nice. Um, Zane's a big fan of macarons, so we got him. You can buy these little tins of macarons, which we got him. So he was nibbling on macarons as we were um, wandering through the Marais. And our friends who had lived in Paris had recommended, they were like, well, in your neighborhood, there's this the best falafel restaurant in Paris. Oh, wow. It's called uh, La Du Falafel, and it's on the Rue de Rossier. Mm. And so we we're walking through, and by that point, it had just opened. So we were like, you know, we're we're hungry. Let's go in and have you know what was an enormous, enormous falafel, and and didn't realize <laughs> just how famous it was because by the time you know we had our we had our sandwiches, we then walked to. Um, the Centre Pompidou to kind of check out that area and then walked back because it was about um, check-in time. And by the time we got back, there were so many people waiting in line to get in <laughs> that literally you couldn't walk through the Rue de Rossier. It was like literally wow. people pressed up against each other from one side of the street to the other side of the street. Right. So that's Las du Falafel uh, on 34 Rue des Rosiers. Hmm. Yes. I'm so going would, to have to try it. <laughs> you have to. There's there's another falafel place that's next door that clearly is trying to uh cash in, I think, on the on the sure. reputation of the other one. But uh the the last du falafel is, is the real deal. Here's the real one. All right. Yay. <laughs> and you had yeah. even include a picture. It looks very nice. It looks, was very it was really good. And looks nothing like any falafel I've ever had before. This this looks like the kind of thing I could eat. And, and they and they serve uh, lemonade as well. That's that's nice. the drink. And one of the reasons why it was so crowded, also just to um, put this out there, is it was Sunday, 
And for anybody who's been to, to Paris knows that basically um, Paris basically shuts down on, on yes. Sunday. And um, so one of the reasons why this restaurant is, is so popular is because it's a Jewish run um, restaurant. It's, it's basically something to do on Sundays when a lot of the other parts of the city is, uh, is closed. Mm-hmm, so. mm-hmm. Very nice. Very nice. So, so then what, you went to Centre Pompidou. We went to Centre Pompidou. We actually didn't um, we didn't uh, go in, but you know, as somebody who has got a degree in architecture, um, it's a building that I'd studied, and I'm wow. a big fan of, of both of the the architects, uh, Richard Rogers and uh, Renzo Piano, and had always wanted to see the building. And what was funny is seeing it then in real life was like, why did they build that building here? It's like That's it's right. so <laughs> it's so out of scale, and it's, it's it had always been one of my favorite buildings. The idea of um, turning a building inside out so that all of the the services, all the air conditioning, all the plumbing is actually on the exterior of the building, so that Yay. they opened up they opened up all of these galleries that they could have galleries without um, columns and would be uninterrupted by any of the services. But when you actually see the building, and you know, especially when coming at it through the Marais, the Marais is you know one of the the Gothic areas that wasn't torn down during the Haussmann um, remaking of Paris. Right. And so you're coming out of this beautiful Gothic area of Paris, and then all of a sudden there's this, you know just totally out of scale yes. <laughs> structure. It's crazy. It's out of it's scale. Just, it's out of time too, but that's okay. I mean, it's okay. I mean, it, yeah. it's some people, you know, some people f- find it to be, you know, one of their favorite parts of Paris. So I don't want to disparage it no, that no, much, but, people love it. but it's, but it, it is, com- it's completely different than what I ever imagined having studied the building. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's, a very, it's, it's a nice place, but but you didn't go in the museum, did you? You just no, looked at no, the building we, from the outside. We, we had toyed with it, but again, we didn't we didn't get tickets in advance. And like everything else in Paris, the the lines to get in were just were crazy. Yeah, we actually had our uh, appointment to go to the Eiffel Tower, so we ended up you know leaving the Centre Pompidou in order to to take our um, our tour through the Eiffel Tower that we discussed in our last podcast. Very good, very good, awesome. So, um, the, the thing that we did, our big, uh, trip that we had, um, that we had scheduled in advance was we finally decided that, you know, because it was February, because the weather wasn't going to be great, we bought tickets before we left the United States to go to the Louvre, Mm. um, which was fantastic. Um, and because, you know, we were going with a a 10 year old, we decided that we were just going to go and try and see the, the big stuff and the stuff that would be easy for him to see. So we really concentrated our visit on two of the wings where all the kind of like famous things are, which is the Denon wing and the Sully wing. So the, the Denon wing is where the Mona Lisa is. Uh, it's where winged victory is. Right. Um, so we saw those two things. Um, then, you know, for me, I wanted to see a lot of the David paintings and those, those are all in that wing. I love those two. They're fantastic. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're really, especially if you study French history at all and and the history of the revolution, it's really, I think, important to see. Mm -hmm. And, uh, then I'm a big fan of Egyptian art. So we went uh, into the Suli wing, which is where all the Egyptian art is. And it's actually also where the Venus de Milo is. Right, right. And then the other thing that we did in the Louvre, which was really great to see, is when you go down, when they were excavating for the pyramid, um, they excavated and they found the original um, uh, walls that were yeah. at the moat of the original fortress that was the beginning of the Louvre. Right. And so you go down and you can actually see all of the original, you know, basically castle walls, which is just with a kid especially is, is fantastic to do. Yeah, it's really good to see, yeah. And and you did it right. I mean, you had picked a few things you wanted to see and that was it, you know. That's, that was, that's the yeah. right way to do it. Quick hit, get in, see what you want to see, and get out. And one, one thing that I would recommend, too, is a lot of people um, use the pyramid as the main entry, but there's another entry to the Louvre that's actually off of the Rue de Rivoli. It's the um, Richelieu Passage. Yes. And basically, you walk in, and you walk in, and there's nobody waiting, and the security is, is right there. So it took us probably about three minutes to right. get through security, which, you know, from what I understand, getting into the Louvre any other way, you know, you can s- stand for hours yes. to try and get Yes. And it, sometimes that, that entrance is not open. That's the reason why we can't tell everybody to go there because some days they close it, depending on security levels and whatever, they, they open and close it. 
I've, I've, I've actually called the Louvre just to ask them, is it open? But they don't see the people who take care of the doors don't speak English. So you have to, <laughs> you have to be able to speak French to them. But that's what I do when I go. I just go, is that entrance open? Yes, no, okay. Yeah. If it's if it's open, it's actually it's worth doing. Yeah. I didn't realize that they only opened it on uh, on uh, particular days. We yeah. we apparently got lucky. Yeah, you did, but that's okay. I mean, lots. It, it's open a lot. It's just sometimes it's not. So, but it, it felt like our little uh, our little secret. So we 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 did the <laughs> Louvre on on day two, and then um, we had lunch at our our favorite cafe, which is around the corner, which is the um, uh, Taverne. Uh, de la arbre sec. L'arbre sec, um, yes. Which is really fantastic. And for anybody who goes, I would recommend the uh, steak tartare. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a must. We, and yeah, we talked about it on the last podcast. It sounds really exactly, good. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so that was day number two. Mm-hmm. And so day number three, you know, going and seeing the uh, the loop actually worked out. So we decided to to do the Orsay uh, on day number three. Mm. And so uh, because we hadn't bought tickets in advance, you know, realized that, you know, standing in line was going to be um, not a good idea. So called our concierge, and luckily they sell tickets to uh, the Orsay at our hotel. Excellent. So we got, got our tickets. hotels do that. It's a great idea. I would totally recommend it to, to anybody. So we got tickets and we went down and walked. And one of the things that we did this trip is um, because we were staying at the Place de Vosges, the, um, the walk every morning that we would do is you go out to the Place de Vosges and um, in one corner of the Place de Vosges, uh, I guess it's the south west or southeast I don't, there's a there's a little door that's in the corner and you go in and you go through a passage and it it opens up to this beautiful courtyard that's the courtyard of the hotel uh, Sully, okay uh, which is just an amazing you know, kind of medieval looking courtyard and then you go actually through the hotel Sully, and you end up on the rue saint antoine okay and so what we would do every morning is we would take that that walk to the Rue Saint Antoine, and there's a you know I hate to say it, but there's a chain store that's uh, a chain bakery that's there that's called Paul. Oh yeah. And Paul, but the but the food is amazing. So the what we would good, do every yeah. morning, it was really good. So we would go and get our coffees, and then we would get um, a jambon uh, sandwich. Yeah. And we'd walk down to jambon the set. Exactly. <laughs> and we would get that and then we would go down and we would walk to the Seine and go down on the riverside and have our breakfast overlooking the Seine every morning. Well, there and you go. And the bread fan- there is really good. The bread was fantastic. Yeah, the bread at Paul is, I like it. Sometimes I stop by just to get the bread. I don't even get sandwiches. I just get, a, you know, some baguettes. It's good. It's good. Bread. It's really it's really good. And, and for us, we... Um, it, it was a total coincidence, but uh, the the bridge we we uh, had our breakfast adjacent to the bridge that goes over to uh, I don't know if it's uh, the Ile Saint Louis, um, but it's this arch bridge, and there was a saxophonist mm-hmm. that both mornings that we we had our breakfast there was playing saxophone on the riverside, so we we had our breakfast music and had our breakfast sandwich and sat down on the Seine. And um, this is a tradition. I mean, my brother plays the trumpet and he likes to do the same. He likes to go under the bridges to he says you, you hear yourself much better. I say well, with it, a trumpet, how could you not hear yourself? <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was it was wonderful. And then we, we walked to the Orsay. And, um, you know, what we definitely tried to do is stop and play some of the games that they have along the riverside, you know, ping pong tables and, and they have uh, some paddle balls. And uh, got in, got to the Orsay early, which I would definitely recommend. Yeah. Um, because by the time we left, which was very early afternoon, the crowds were just were insane. Yeah. Um, but for kids, what's really cool is, you know, you go in, you go to the, the coat check, and if you go down into the main hall, at the very, very back end of the main hall of uh, the Musée d'Orsay, there is this scale model of Paris. Yes. Three-dimensional three model, and there's a glass floor, and the model is underneath the floor. And so yes. you, you can see where the Opera Garnier is, and then you see all of it. So it's like flying and over And there's Paris. also a wooden model of Opera Garnier, isn't there? Yes, there is. Yeah, and, so, you, can, and you can play with the stage stuff. You yeah, can, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember so, that. I, I so, played yeah. with that. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> well, as an architect, you know, I, I thought it was fantastic. And, and for Zane, for my son, I mean, it was really, really cool for him because, you know, to go to an art museum and to see something like that 
was yeah. was really fantastic. Yeah. So we we did that, and uh, then we went upstairs uh, where all the kind of like really major pieces are. Right. Um, there is a room in the back that's about two rooms with Van Gogh Van Gogh uh, paintings. Yep. yep. Uh, which which are beautiful. I'd highly recommend it. You know, one word of warning is those rooms are packed. Yes. Completely packed. And then on our way out, um, I wanted to see um, uh, Olympia because I'm a big Manet fan. And if I'm not mistaken, Olympia is actually on the ground floor on the northern side uh, in one of the galleries. So we were we were trying to find that. And I have to tell a funny story. It's a little off color, so excuse me. But but um, <laughs> Look, one of the things that here. was really good about this trip was Zane had his first smartphone. And so what he was doing to keep himself busy was he was actually starting to take pictures of things. And mm-hmm. you're not supposed to take pictures in the Orsay, but he was doing it. And as we were trying to find Olympia, we kind of heard some people chuckling and we looked over. And Zane was standing in front of Corbet's um, Birth of the World. And for anybody who doesn't know this this painting, basically it's a painting of a, a woman's genitalia. Okay. <laughs> and, and he was just standing in front of it taking one picture after another picture after another picture after another <laughs> picture. <laughs> He was intrigued, obviously. <laughs> he was very intrigued. So we had to, you know, go up to him and say, okay, buddy, this is art. And it's it's good that you're taking pictures of art. Yes. Please don't show these pictures to your friends on the bus when we get home. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, it was, yeah. it was very eye opening. <laughs> I, I don't remember that piece. Now I'm going to have to go look it up. <laughs> Yeah, it, it apparently originally hung in um, in a private collection, and what they would do is it had a it had a curtain over it, and you know they would they would mm-hmm. pull the curtain back when they wanted to see it and you know cover it up again. But now it's it's just hanging in the gallery at the Orsay. So, what's the name of the piece again? <laughs> I believe it's called the the Birth of the World. And oh, it's, uh, by, yes, by yes, yes. I I know it. I know it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Yes. So, yes. Exactly. We're gonna have to wipe off uh, your your phone when we get home. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a lovely piece. It's very good. It, it's it's actually be- it's beautiful. Yeah, it's very definitely good. beautiful. So um, we went back out after that and walked around. Um, and then that evening had uh, dinner back in the uh, Marais again at a restaurant, which I would recommend to anybody. And it's called Chez Robert et Louise. And it's a small little restaurant. Actually, Zane found it. We were we were walking around the neighborhood, and he said, "Well, let's let's go in here." And he pointed at it. It's t- completely picturesque. There are little red and white checked um, curtains that are in the window. You go in. There's one bar that runs down the side, and only one, a single row of tables that runs down. It's all timbered on the inside, mm. and. They have this enormous, enormous wood burning fireplace that's in the back. Mm. And everything that they cook is cooked on the open flame. So, wow. you know, we had escargot on the open flame. I had a duck confit that was on um, the open flame. And then uh, Michael and Zane actually uh, had a ribeye that was that was cooked. And it's one of the best meals I think I've ever had in my entire life. Wow. Robert et Louise. It, All right. Robert et Louise. Um, the, the gentleman. I have, to, I have to say, sorry, again, because I was in, uh, in uh, Glasgow recently and we had a problem going into – pubs that kind of look like this restaurant because i'm looking at the picture that you took because we we had a child with us this is not going to happen to you in france you can walk even if a restaurant serves alcohol it's it's not a dance hall it's not a club it's you can go in and and eat and have beer and wine and whatever there's no restrictions like that in france right and actually it was it was really cute because the guy I believe the owner was there, and he was just sitting at the bar, actually doing his uh, accounting on his. I uh, had an Apple iPad, yeah, and he he really made a big fuss over our son, so uh, mm. g- gave him candy, and so it was it was really fantastic. Nice. You know, yeah. one of the things I really like about traveling with with a, a child is it kind of opens up all of these conversations that you sure. wouldn't necessarily you know ever have. Yeah, um, there. Yeah, the so duck looks good. You have a picture of your duck. It looks very good. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It was, it was I love duck. So yeah, um, yeah. It's fantastic. Yep. So the the last day that we were there, the last full day that we were there, we went out to Père Lachaise Cemetery, which oh. I'd always wanted to see. Yeah. Um, I think if I ever did it again, I definitely would take either a taxi or take the metro. Um, yeah. it, it's a it's a really long walk, um, and not necessarily quite a lot to see. 
Um, yeah. I, I thought it was really interesting. I would definitely have a, um, uh, a, a disclaimer that if you go, make sure that you take a map with you um, because yes. they have maps that are printed on some signs, but there's, there's one at each of the entries. There's like a front entry, which is a huge gate. And then there's an entry back in the back, Right. but that's, that's the only place that actually has kind of a guide to who's buried where. Yeah. On, on, um, I did an episode about the Lachaise, Père Lachaise cemetery and I, I put a, a map. I have a, a scanned map that you can print at home and I'll, I'll put it on this episode link as well so that you can print it out before you go because it's, it's true. You, I mean, they do have maps that you can take away, but they're at the little, uh, I don't know what you call it. Le, 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 le garde. Um, right. and, and he, he goes away for lunch for a couple of hours in the middle of the day. And so if you happen to be, or he goes off and he locks the thing and then you can't have the maps anymore. It's kind of a pain. Right. So yeah, do bring one. Indefinitely. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's really amazing, really. Uh, it, there's so many graves that, you know, I think the biggest takeaway, I, I was really interested because some of the, the, the luminaries that um, mean a lot to me, like Oscar Wilde and Edith Piaf, you know, they're all interned there as is uh, Chopin. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I think the biggest thing for Zane is he was, he was, uh, uh, imagining what would happen if French zombies came to life. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that was the big takeaway from him. Excellent. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And you can take some good pictures. I mean, if you like photography, you can take some nice pictures, you know. But it's, yeah, after a while, because it's a very large cemetery, and it takes a while to take to find the graves that you want to find. It's not necessarily the signage isn't nothing crass like saying, oh, the grave, Chopin's grave is this way, you know. Exactly. Everybody's looking for Chopin's grave, but they, they're not going to put up a sign because that would be crass. So you have to look, hunt around a little bit. Right. But, it, you know, it's, it's definitely worth seeing. I, I, I think it's a good second or third trip to Paris thing to do. I, I don't think Agreed. I would necessarily do it on my first, but it's, you know, after you start getting to know the city, it's, it's something good to go and, and do to kind of expand your, your uh, understanding of what's there. Yeah. So we, after that, we went and had lunch at Benoit, which um, was really great. Um, mm-hmm. For anybody who goes to Benoit, I will just put out um, uh, a description that order light <laughs> mm. because the, um, the portions are enormous. I had a cassoulet. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I had a cassoulet, and the cassoulet they they brought ac- actually in the crusade and and spooned it out. And I would have to say that my cassoulet was easily big enough for at least two people. Yeah. Okay. So just fair warning, um, but that you know, for if you want to go have a, a nice fancy lunch without going too crazy, uh, you know, I would definitely recommend Benoit. And so you has- said it was expensive. How expensive is it, more or less? Um, it's been over a year since we were there. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't cheap. And what, it, you know, the, the few criticisms I, I have read of it is that the food that's there is actually because it's classic French food. Um, it's, you can get it at a lot of other cafes or taverns or stuff, stuff like yeah. that. Um, but this definitely is, you, you go for the environment. Um, okay. it, it definitely, it, it's an ex, it's an experience. They have the, they 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 bring out at the beginning. They bring out these amazing cheese pastries to to start you off. That are some of the best things I've I've ever had. They're just mm. really fantastic. <laughs> and and it's Very funny nice. too because, as I'd mentioned, my my French was starting to get better by this point. So when I came in and they I asked to be spe- seated in French, and um, they asked you know who needed you know menus the carte. So when, and this has happened to me now several times, is what they'll do is they'll come out and they'll give Michael and they'll give Zane the menus in English and they'll hand me the, the menu in French. Very nice. And, and I said, but, you know, and they looked at, they looked at me and they said, you don't need the English one. Right, right. Do the French. So come go, on. Do the, do the French. Come on. Do, do the work. Do the work. That's great. That's great. So. So we went to went to Benoit, and then afterwards, because we were very close to the um, Hotel uh, de Ville, uh, which yeah. is the city hall, they actually yeah. wintertime have an amazing ice skating rink uh-huh. that is in front of that. So we went ice skating, um, which was really fantastic to be in, in France and to go ice skating right on the Seine and in front of the the Hotel de Ville. Yeah. Um, 
One, one thing I would recommend, though, is for some reason, they wouldn't let you on the ice without gloves. That's right. So we regulations. Actually, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we had to pop in. Uh, there's a little department store that's around the corner. And so we popped in and bought gloves and came back out. And, and ah. ice cream. that was that was a lot of fun. Is it real ice or is it one of these synthetic? It's it, it, they're synthetic. Yeah. OK. It's synthetic. They also have one um, in the wintertime. They also have a ice skating rink that's on the first level of the Eiffel Tower. Right. Right. Which. You know, it's very, it's very small, but, you know, that's one thing I wanted to do that we didn't do that I thought would be kind of a fun. It's fun, I, you know, spend so. spend a half an hour twirling around. It's fun. Yeah, it's good. And again, it's a good thing to do with kids to let them burn off yeah. some, some, some energy. Yeah. So so that was pretty much the, the second time that we were in Paris. Excellent. And, and then the third time we went back was actually we were there this past New Year's Day. And um, the reason why we were there is we had decided this year to, to spend New Year's Eve in London. Okay. And we were so close to, to Paris. And I had always wanted to take the Eurostar. I was, you know, the idea of actually taking the Channel um, train was something that I've always wanted to do ever since they, they launched it. Yeah. So what we decided to do is to, to spend New Year's Day in Paris. And um, one of the other reasons why we wanted to go for New Year's Day is um, there's a museum, a private museum that I've wanted to go to for years. Uh, for anybody who's seen uh, Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris, there's a scene where the Fitzgeralds uh, throw a party. And the Marion uh, Cotillard character um, tells the um, uh, Luke Will uh, Owen Wilson uh, character, I, I want to show you this, this beautiful carousel. It's from the 1800s, and she comes and she shows it to him. And it's this really beautiful carousel. It's all brass, and it's, it's bicycles. And I always assumed when I saw the movie that it was a movie set, but it's actually not. It's um, part of this private museum. And oh, wow. um, what this museum is is um, there are all of these old um, historic wine warehouses um, which is where I believe the king used to store his wine in um, an area of Paris that's called Bercy. Yeah. And th it has now been um, renovated into um, kind of a shopping district. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it has major sports arenas. I mean, this is where regular French people live. It's west of Paris a little bit. Exactly. I, actually, I think it's east of Paris, isn't it? East? No, Bercy. Mm. I think Bercy is west. No, sorry, it's I, east. Sorry, I inverted. Yes, yes, yes. It's it's. I, I apologize. I was going to say. I, yes. I'm going to I'm going to trust it's you because you're east. the <laughs> No, no, it's you're right. It's east. I was I was I had my directions mixed up. Sorry. So, yes. So so we came in. We came into the the um, the Gare du Nord. We had lunch in the Marais. And then um, took a taxi out to this museum. And what this museum is, is it's, it's housed in several of the old wine warehouses. And the, the gentleman who owns it has been collecting all of these antique carousels. So I think there are five antique carousels. There are all of these um, uh, fairground attraction games. Um, and what they do is they only open it once a year to the general public. And it happens to be wow. the week between Christmas and New Year's. Wow. And so, you know, it's someplace I'd always wanted to go and we were going to be there during the right time period. So we mm -hmm. said, you know what, let's take, let's take the train and let's go. And, go, and yeah. I'm so glad that we did because, um, one of the things that's really amazing about it is you don't just go and look at the carousels. They actually let you ride them. Oh, wow. And so this brass carousel that I'd wanted to see, it's actually powered by the people who are riding it. So... <laughs> You get on and you start pedaling and you and all the other riders are actually pedaling it. And everybody's trying to go as fast as they can. I actually got a little worried because the centrifugal force was starting to get to the point. I was afraid Zane was going to fall off. I was oh, like, wow. no, hold on, hold on. But, um, but what was really funny is it's one of the few things that we've done because it's an area of Paris that's really not a touristed area. I think we were clearly the only Americans that were, were on this tour. Oh, nice. And so... It was conducted completely in French, and it was really funny because we showed up, and, and everybody is dressed 
for this winter festival. So this one guy's dressed as this big snow monster, and then people are dressed <laughs> as elves, and they're you know very you know very exuberantly talking in French about what we're going to see and the you know the uh, the magnificent spectacles and things like that. I look over at Zane, and he's just like mortified, like Dad, why did you take me? You know, to this thing, this is going to be in French. I don't speak French. So I, I waited until there's a, a little bit of a break and, and went up and explained to our tour guide, you know, uh, that I spoke French, but that neither of the two people that I was with spoke a, yes. um, a word. And she just kind of grinned and she said, you know, un moment, uh, monsieur. And she went and she got uh, a transcript in English. Oh, and that's it's a really transcript nice. of everything. So it was good. And she said, don't, you know, don't worry about it. We'll say this thing at the beginning, but what the only reason why people are here is so that they can ride the rides. So, uh, <laughs> that's great. So, but it was really, it was really a special thing. It was a great way to kick off the new year. And, um, and you know, there, there are three or four carousels that you get to ride. And then there are these like really amazing games where it's, it's like, um, so they call it ski ball, where you you take the balls and you throw the balls up, and depending on where they land, you you get different points. <laughs> and there are these scenes that then, when you get different points, it makes the these different um, figurines move. So one of them, for instance, is this, a scene of a restaurant, and you have got these little scale um, uh, waiters. And when you get certain amounts of points, the little waiters like rush, and whoever you can get from the the kitchen to the the dining room wins at the end wow you know it's, I, it's, I i don't think i had ever heard of this this is fun it's so much fun it, if you've got they will open it you can make reservations if you've got i think parties of 10 people or more mm. but then they do open it up um that one week one thing i will have to say because of this year's heightened security um, usually apparently it's like a, an open house, but this year you actually had to, um, make arrangements to go at a specific time so that ah. they could kind of screen everybody, yeah. but it was definitely worth it. And the, and the thing that was then really special is, you know, it was all special, but at the very end, the last thing that you do is they take you into this little pavilion that I think was a pavilion that was built for a carousel. But instead of there being a carousel in the center, it's basically just functions as an auditorium and all the kids get down on, on the floor. And a mime comes out, and and a mime does this, you know, great mime balloon show, mm -hmm. and um, you know, pulls kids out of the audience, and and does all these like really cute balloon animals with them, and it was so fun to see Zane because you know I'm starting to realize that mimes are the international language, because yeah, yeah. you know he he's like on the floor with all of these you know kids from Paris, mm -hmm. you know, belly laughing with the rest of them at all at all the jokes that the that the mime was was telling. Right, right. Oh, it's, that's great. It was just, it was fantastic. I was like, oh, you know, for just that moment, it was like, wow, I kind of feel like I live here. Mm -hmm. It was so cool. It was really cool. Yeah, that's great. That, I'm, I'm going to have to look into that. I, I had never heard of it. So, yeah, I mean, I there's was, something I was... somewhat similar, but not as big. It's the, it's the Museum of uh, Magic in Paris as well, but that's open re year round. And it's a small little museum. I think it's also a private museum. And they do shows like that for kids. And it's mostly French people that go. You know, it's very few tourists ever make it there. But it's good to go when you have kids, because, young kids, because they show all these tricks. And they do a, a, a show. And you and it's kind of a history of magic. And I don't know very many young boys in particular who are not a little bit fascinated by magic tricks. Right. So, so yeah, that's... That's one that we we've been to, but I had never heard of the Musée des Arts Forains. That's that's kind of cool. I would I would recommend I have all the things that we've done. That was that's pretty much at the top of my list of of things. And the photos that, that uh, you've included look very nice. It's really it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. I, and I only gave you four photographs. I think I've got about fifty. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as somebody who actually um, likes photography, the opportunities are amazing because yeah. they're all these really and you know incredible oh, antiques. Yeah, yeah, and there there are things like you walk into one room and they've got a Mary. They've got this. Uh, 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 mannequin dressed up as Marie Antoinette on a full size elephant <laughs> like, <laughs> that's being that's being suspended from the air by a by a model of a hot air balloon. It's just like it's it's crazy. That's and fun. and and they do these things, they also have these uh, amazing digital projections. So you walk into one room and these digital projections come on and the entire room goes dark and then all of the 
all of the uh, exhibits actually basically come to life through these digital projections, wow. and everybody starts ballroom dancing, and it's it was it's really fantastic. Magical, yeah. So it's did really you magical. did you head back to London for, to your hotel in London that night? We did. We were we were just there for about eight hours. And, so how was um, it? How was how was the experience of taking the Eurostar and all that? What you had been looking forward to it? Was it was it good, bad, indifferent? It was it was fantastic. It was really easy, and the you know the entire trip is two hours and twenty minutes. So um, in London, you know, you, you catch it at uh, Saint Pe Saint Pe uh, Saint. Pancreas. Pancreas. Yes, yeah. thank you. And um, you go, it's a high-speed train. There's one stop on the English side just before you get to the tunnel. Right. Um, what I didn't recommend, didn't realize until we did it is the, the amount of time that you spend under the English channel is only literally about 15 to 20 minutes. Right. And um, and then you come back out. And it was really interesting seeing the French, French countryside. And then you come in through the Gare du Nord. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we actually had more time scheduled to be in Paris uh, than we actually spent because we were pretty tired after going to the museum. And being as though it was New Year's Day, there was a lot of stuff that was closed. Um, mm -hmm. So we did end up at the Gare du Nord about an hour and a half sooner than our tickets. Uh -huh. But um, we did go up to the, the ticket counter. And, you know, even though we had, you know, reserved tickets, they actually switched to get us on the earlier train. Cool. Um, and they actually didn't, they didn't charge us any kind of uh, service fee to do that. So we were able yeah, to Yeah, you can do that very often on French trains. If you've paid up to a certain level of fare, they, you can exchange for other times and even on flights i when we used to fly to the u.s more often than we do now because we lived in the u.s and came home from, to, from france to visit very often we would hit paris and we had like three hours to go before the, our next flight onto toulouse and we could just go take an earlier flight it was never right. a problem so. One one thing I would recommend at the Gare du Nord because the the waiting area at the Gare du Nord is is very very crowded, and there is a an area at the back that's like a first class lounge, and we didn't have tickets that could have gotten us into the first class lounge, but we went in, and I you'd have to um, look it up because I don't recall which credit card it used, but if you have certain I think American Express cards, you can actually get in and go to the first class lounge, which is a lot more humane than kind of the the waiting area that's where everybody nice. else is waiting. Nice, nice, nice. It's, it's kind of a nice, a nice trick to, to know about. Wow. So, wow. Yeah, what, a, what a trip. So yeah. where, where are you going to next? You're, well, the, the next trip is actually not to, to France. The next trip is we're going to go to Venice at the end of June. And oh, then I, nice. I'm trying to figure out where the next trip to go to, because now that we've been to Paris three times, I definitely want to go back. And, you know, there, there are things because we went the, in the winter the last two times, there are things that I've been wanting to do that you can't do. Like mm -hmm. you can't see Monet's garden in the wintertime because it's closed. Right. Um, when we were there in February, I had wanted to go to Champagne, but a lot of the tasting rooms are closed. Right. Yeah, in the, the winter so time, yeah. You, it would be good if you could come like starting May, May through October, almost everything is open. And right. Those are, those are better times. And your son is still, well, he's... He's 11 now. Older. So. Yeah, he's 11, so he probably can't skip too much school, but um, but it's, I mean, like for American kids, school is over by by the end of May, typically. Right. So if you came in June some year, it would, you know, that's that's a good time because French kids are still in school, yet things are mostly open. Everything is open. Right. Well, the, the, the other good thing that we want to do is we we – we have not yet been to Versailles, which oh, we want to do. Yeah. But one of the reasons why I, we waited to go is um, we want to go when the gardens are open. And yeah. so we didn't think that going in the wintertime was a good idea. But but one of the things that I really want to do is um, I really want to start seeing places that are in the south of France. So for some reason mm – -hmm. um, Good for you. Say, you're, you're just trying to be nice to me, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's really funny because – um, one of the trips that I would like to take sooner rather than later is, you know, we've been to Barcelona since the first time that we went to um, Paris. Yeah. And one of the days that we were in Barcelona, we took the train to Figueres. And I realized that the train line that we were on is actually the Toulouse line. Yeah. And it, it was like, well, if we just known this, 
then you know we could have done a, a combo trip and and very easily done a couple of days in Barcelona and a day or two in Toulouse. Yeah. So and one of the reasons why I'd like to go to Toulouse as well is my father actually um, worked for NASA, and um, I would like to I understand that there is the the space center that's outside of Toulouse, the that's space right. city. That's right. That's right. And yeah. so. Um, you know, Zane, our son, my, my mother-in-law actually lives in Florida, just south of Cape Canaveral. So he's been to NASA because one set of grandparents lives very close to NASA. And then his other grandfather, you know, worked for NASA. So I've always kind of been intrigued to see, you know, what the European Space Agency is about. Yeah, so that, that museum in Toulouse is the um, Cité de l'Espace is what it's called. And it's pretty small. I mean, it's like a, a, a mini air and space museum, but truly mini. But People around here love it, and it's always got lots of, you know, it's well attended. And now they're also opening, because Toulouse has so much aeronautics, they're also opening a museum of airplanes. Um, so Cité de l'Espace is more satellites and uh, that that part of space. And there's also going to be the big airplane museum I think it might op be open already. Yeah, it is open already. I haven't seen it yet, but it's open already. And I, I, I've seen it many times because the, all the planes used to be outside of uh, Airbus. So when you went, went to work on Airbus, which I did, you, it, you walked by the plane sometimes, depending on what building you were going to. Um, but now they're all in a nice big museum thing with exhibits <laughs> now, and all that. Now you have to pay to see them. <laughs> yeah, you kind of do. You used to be able to just, you know, if you, if you worked at Airbus, you could just walk around, but now you have to pay never, to see them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> never, never a free lunch, not even in France. No, so you may be in a socialist country, but you're still going to pay. But uh, yeah, so so that would be a good trip. And then um, one of the other things that I would really like to do is um, we have a friend here who uh, – was born in France and still has family in France. And one of her cousins actually is a private uh, driver and tour guide in um, the French Riviera. So she's actually put us in contact with him. And he has said that, you know, if we come over and he can be our tour guide and, and can um, kind of take us to some of the areas that aren't quite as touristed, that's one of the things that's yeah. on my list of things to, to do. Yeah, in, so. Provence, in Provence, it's really important to not – to, to play, plan it right because it's so crowded in the summer. The Toulouse area will be more crowded in the summer, but nothing like Provence. You know, if, if you're going to be in the Gers, Toulouse, uh, Perpignan area, even Basque country, and then going a little bit into Barcelona, that's never going to be super crowded. Even Camargue, it's, yeah, there's a lot of people, but it's doable. But if you, the, the further, East, you go towards Italy on the Riviera and all of that. Oh, my goodness. That is just so crowded. You know, it, it drives me crazy. So, so you have to, <laughs> well, so you have to plan it. We'll, we'll put that one down the list then. Well, no, it's, it's, it's really well worth seeing. It's awesome. But you have to, I think it's best if you are with somebody like this friend you were mentioning who right. knows to avoid the biggest, you know, because you don't want to be – in a parking lot. I mean, some of these places, just to get around, you know, just to drive two kilometers will take you half an hour. Wow. You could have walked it five times, you know. So. Yikes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, so there's there's stuff you need to know uh, to really enjoy the Riviera in the summer. And by summer, I mean July and August. The rest right. of the time, it's not near as bad. So oh, That's good to know. All right. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show twice. You well, thank have, you. You have shared some good tips. And visiting France with kids, it sounds like, has not uh, has not phased you very much. It sounds like your son had a great time. I do it again in a minute. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much, David, and, um, and safe trips. Oh, thank you. Au revoir. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Many thanks to listeners who donate to the show or use our Amazon or hotel booking links on joinusinfrance.com or on the show notes that appear on the podcasting app on your phone. Most new listeners find the show through a recommendation from a friend. If you're the kind of fan who drops our name here and there, bless you and thank you for your help. I hope you have a great time in France. And when you come back, consider sharing your experience and thoughts with other listeners Drop me a line, Annie at joinusinfrance.com, if you'd like to do a trip report with me. Thank you. Au revoir. 
This episode is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Non-Derivatives International License.